้วิดูกันจัดอ l right, hello, hello, everyone. Please excuse us for the delay. I've been running around. Mike, hello. How are you? Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm doing afternoon well. You. Yourself? Doing good for a warm Thursday. Is it warm by you? It's no, hot outside. I, I'm close to the beach, a few blocks from the beach, and it's not that warm here. Hope everyone is staying cool where they're at. <laughs> My views aren't beach views, but <laughs> I didn't say I have a beach view. I said oh, close okay. to the beach. Well. Beach weather. <laughs> yes, it's beach weather. All right. Well, let's get started. Looks like we've got a good group with us so far. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. We are a national program with over a thousand locations across the country, and we offer no cost services to local small businesses. Now, our services are at no cost to you because your tax dollars have actually already taken care of our fees. So. Just take a deeper listen, and I'm going to tell you about all the fun things we have for you. Um, and keep in mind, it's all for free. <clears throat> Mike, can you see my uh, slides advancing? Yes, we do see it. Thanks. Okay, okay perfect. <clears throat> all right. So uh, here are our physical center locations. You'll see that we are in Camarillo, Santa Clarita, Pasadena, all the way out to Laverne, throughout Los Angeles, the South Bay, down into Long Beach. Now, these are our physical locations, but keep in mind, if you are within the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, Ventura counties, we can serve you, we can assist you. <clears throat> And here's what we can assist you with, uh, no cost business advising. And so you're able to sit one-on-one, -on -one, again, for free with one of our business experts. Now those experts are, I mean, range from various industries. We're talking uh, construction and marketing, um, taxes and finances. Uh, if you're just starting out and looking to create a business plan, we have people for you. If you're looking for to do market research, Again, uh, uh, if you're looking to um, acquire licenses or you're not sure what you should be acquiring, we have experts for you. We also offer virtual trainings. And so those are comprehensive workshops that assist you in adapting, growing, or again, if you're just starting out, it'll help you to start out with your business. <clears throat> Please be sure to get in contact with us. We are looking forward to working with you. Our phone number is 866-588-7232, or you can go online, smallbizla.org forward slash new client. Now, if you have reached us and you are outside of the Los Angeles area, you can go to americasspdc.org forward slash find your SBDC. So Mike, quick housekeeping. <clears throat> Please do. Before you get started. Okay, everyone. We love that you've joined us today, and we also would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, be sure to put those into the Q&A. Let's keep them on topic, um, but throw those questions into the Q&A, and then understand that the chat's going to be reserved for any kind of um, information that, we're looking, that we'd like to share with you. Um, again, I'm going to also share a link to previous recordings, so you can check them out there. But uh, the chat's also reserved for any kind of conversing you guys would like to do amongst yourselves as it relates to the topic at hand. Um, Mike, I'm not sure if you wanted to, but how about we find out who we have with us and the types of industries they come from, the types That's of That's a businesses. good idea. And okay. I often find that people who participate in these types of workshops find synergies amongst themselves. You just mentioned it. So you might find someone that can help you write with your business or vice versa. Totally agree. All right, everyone, I'm going to drop in that um, link to previous recordings. And again, there are several of you with us today. So we actually, we have a nice group. Uh, go ahead and let us know in the chat what, um, let me make sure the chat's enabled. And it is. So go ahead and let us know what sorts of businesses you all have. Thank you. Michael, yeah, I'm going to throw business. it over to you. Thank you. Name of the business website. All that would be helpful to each other as well as to us. By the way, Lauren went through a list of services we provide. I just got off a call, a Zoom session with our ACT team. ACT team stands for Access to Capital Team. And we are aggressively seeking out clients, not in a bad way, in a good way, to help you get loans. And we have an entire team dedicated just for that, who are very, very experienced people 
and helping them get loans. Uh, and we particularly work with SBA uh, back loans as well as other types of loans. We realize interest rates are high, but the money's still there if you need a loan, so come talk to us. I'm going to be talking about performance systems today. Over the past month or so, we've been talking about employees, and we went through the process of creating an employee handbook, and we talked about job descriptions, et cetera. So now we're taking it to the next step, which is performance systems. And I'm going to go ahead and take the time to share my screen. Bear with me a second while I do that. Hey, Mike, we have a, several different industries. We've got a, a furniture reupholstery. Um, someone's in, starting an independent publishing business, tax accountant, uh, nice. pharmacy, uh, writing services, speech and language therapy, a private practice, and then beginning stages of an online retail. So it's a very eclectic group today. That's terrific. And one of the advantages, I see the advantage for the work that I type to do with somebody like a tax accountant, we get to see all different types of businesses. So we get to learn about your business and your industry, which is awesome in my opinion. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my performance systems. It should be coming up. You Do you see it, Lauren? I do, yes. All right. We have 33 slides. This may not take the entire hour, but we'll see how it goes. All right. So uh, for those of you who have not met me, who don't know me, haven't spoken to me, I've been an SBDC advisor since 2016. I started out in business, so to speak, when I was a lad. My father was a, a controller for a company. So I've been in accounting and finance my entire life. Along the way, I worked my way up to controller and CFO for multiple companies. I also earned two finance degrees and a law degree. Started my own uh, consulting company back in 2011, got involved in mergers and acquisitions, and have helped sell numerous companies for for various amounts of money. And I have worked in construction, healthcare, manufacturing, and a whole host of other industries. So that's my beef background. And I am now a professional business advisor and consultant, as well as an investment banker. So let's talk about performance systems overview. If you don't have a carefully structured system of appraisal, it gets chaotic because there's going to be a natural tendency to judge performance arbitrarily and informally. If you do it the right way, it's a good thing. If you do it the wrong way, it's a really bad thing. So I'm going to suggest to you that you put in a formal structure in place to properly appraise and evaluate the people that work for you. By the way, this applies also to independent contractors Although it wouldn't be a formal system as, a, as an employee system, you still want some means of, of uh, evaluating the performance of independent contractors. So performance appraisal systems became, came about because there were simple methods of justifying the income that someone was supposed to be earning, right? So the appraisal was used to decide whether or not the salary or wage was justified. And it was clearly linked to material outcomes. So if somebody was failing in their performance, they got a pay cut. And if they did well, you got a pay raise. And little consideration early on in the centuries was given to the development of possibilities of appraisal. All right, it was felt that a cut in pay or, or, or rise should require the motivation for the employee to improve or continue to perform well. Sometimes it succeeded, sometimes more often not it failed. So early motivational researchers were that the different people with roughly equal work abilities could be paid the same amount of money and you have different levels of motivation and performance. So what did that lead to? What's that conclusion? Pay rates are not the only element that have an impact on employee performance. There's things like morale, self-esteem, recognition, respect, the support, we get also support from the uh, LLU SBDC region and lead center, thanks to people like Lauren, the opportunities that exist within your business. And lots of people want a work-life balance. The days of bringing people and having them work 80, 90, 100 hours a week unless you're on Wall Street 
or you're a CPA firm that needs tax people, and even they're having trouble finding people, are gone. Everybody wants an ability to have a balanced life with a balanced work environment. And that's one of the reasons many people have left uh, companies because they didn't have a work-life balance and keep that in mind. So in the 50s, there was a potential usefulness of appraisal determined as a tool for motivation and development, not just for linking it to compensation. Okay, so the systems that we have today really aren't that old. They're, they started back in the 50s. Give me a minute while I move through this presentation. So a performance management system tracks the performance of employees in a manner that is consistent and measurable. The system ensures workers across the organization are aligned with and contributing to the strategic objectives of the business. It serves multiple purposes, such as, such as transparency, honest and accurate actual evaluation of performance, development of employee skills in line with job tasks, and it serves as a motivational gauge. What it shouldn't be is the means to harass someone based upon your bias, based upon age or race or sexual orientation, religious affiliations, that is what it should not be. You should not coming up with an inordinate list of complaints about employees' performance, especially in this environment, because in this environment, it's an employee's market. So show respect. If someone's failing, then you can come up with ways to help them with a performance improvement plan. So this is not a time to blame the employee for the actions and activities that are outside of the control of the employee. Maybe they don't have the support they need. Maybe they don't have the education that they should have in order for you, for them to meet your expectations. So maybe you put in a means for them to get that education. And we'll be, let me flip this. So let's go back a few centuries. Let's go back a thousand years to ancient Rome. Who were the workers in ancient Rome? For the most part, slaves. And quite honestly, horrible system. Absolutely horrible system because the punishment could be death or it could be freedom. But it was perfectly legal for a master to publicly beat a slave to death should they fail to meet some standard that that master had. Uh, then we get into the early Middle Ages, where the workers were serfs and peasants, basically agricultural societies, okay? So the punishment was still sometimes coercion, sometimes physical coercion. There, there was a possibility that if a serf did really well for their lord or master, they could get some freedom from serfdom. Then we get to the later Middle Ages. And we have, that's when we have the rise of the guilds. We have the craftsmen, we have the guild members, we have the bakers, we have the, the people that, the, the stone masons, and they had presences, apprentices. So what's the punishment for bad work, so to speak? Fines, the guild members could fine each other. Expulsion from the guild. It was a reward, financial gain. Significant financial gain for that matter. We move into the Renaissance, where we have, Da Vinci and Michelangelo. So what were the workers then? For the most part, skilled trades, farmers and merchants was a punishment. Well, if you owed someone money, couldn't pay, could be imprisonment. Uh, what was the reward? If you did really well, of course, uh, you get land, you get money, those types of benefits. Now we come into the industrial revolution. And this was not a great time for workers because you still had slaves here in the United States and elsewhere. You had indentured servants. You had child laborers. Thus, also, you had child laborers in, in earlier centuries. You had farmers and merchants. So there could be whippings. Um, the indentured servants' uh, time could be extended. What was the reward? Uh, if you did really well, freedom. Freedom from indenture to land, money. When you're in, and so there was some rewards for people who did well. Now we move into the 20th century. So what do we have? We have blue collar workers and gray collar workers and white collar workers, still do, okay? What's the punishment? Didn't do well, dock pay, termination. Sometimes physical violence was still imposed uh, at various places. 
was a reward, of course, money and benefits. Now we're in the 21st century. Now things have changed, okay? Now we're talking about all sorts of different means of motivating and benefiting people. Uh, in the early 20th century, there was a gentleman named Taylor, which I'll explain in a minute, who developed the science of management. And in World War II, uh, there was an introduction of performance-based review systems into the US Army. And that's basically how we get the current uh, system along with Peter Drucker's science of management. So we have Frederick Taylor, he is considered the father of scientific management. He was born in Pennsylvania. He began working at a steel company, he became a foreman. And he thought about how he could make things more efficient under him. So he had an interest in work methods and procedures. And he worked for lots of other organizations as well. And he became one of the first management consultants. His scientific principles were those of systemic study. He actually sat there and watched, and he developed time and motion studies, and he published uh, Principles of Scientific Management in 1911. He died in 1959, 1915 at the age of 59. So he assumed that working systems were generally inefficient, and they were. And I mean, we, we realized we had the mechanical line, the assembly line developed by Henry Ford, which helps make things more efficient. But he assumed that workers were naturally inclined to be lazy and inefficient. It's a bad assumption, but that was the assumption at the time. Therefore, he assumed that managers had to overcome this reluctance so that the workers would be incentivized. And the way it did that is you measured everything. So he is considered one of the key principles in scientific management. So he developed something called time and motion studies. A time study measures how long it takes an average worker to complete a task at a normal pace. A motion study is designed to determine the best way to complete a job. Now, when you have manual repetitive tasks, this is important things to do. I worked in a lot of manufacturing companies. We have machines to do stuff. So the time study is not just based upon the person working the machine. You might have three people working a machine. It's also now based on the machine time. For example, when you have milling machines, there's spindle speeds. So if you can determine the average spindle speed to you know, cut out a pattern, then you can, you can do a time study to get that. And then you can measure that month, day after day, week after week, month over month, year after year, which we've done, and compare that to see how well the machine is working over time. Additionally, there's something called mean time between failures, MTBS, uh, and you can measure how long a machine will be in operation before it fails. The, and you can look at the motions of machines as well as people to see whether or not there's a, an appropriate workflow or can you make the workflow better. And there's people that specialize in looking at workflows. So this type of time and motion study still exists today. And it's a good thing to do in, in many circumstances. So a time and motion study is conducted to review individual tasks that are carried out in the workplace, identifying specifically how long each task currently takes. How long does it take for the operator to load the machine? Okay, How long does it take the machine to cut out the pattern? And what is the physical activity? Do I have to actually lift up the item to put it on the machine? I was at a glass manufacturing plant numerous times over the past month or two, and they still have operators that actually have to load the machines appropriately to make the glass vials. And the, the machines are a little bit older, so they're not working as well as they used to. And I suggest that they do a time and motion study because they've updated their standards in, a, in 10 years. The outcomes of this assessment highlight time taken for each stage of the process. And they can benchmark it. And you want an outsider to do it because you get biased if you do it from the inside. You want an unbiased evaluation of the current process. And there's management consultants that will come in and do this. Um, and if you do that, you might end up with a better result. You might end up with less movement because things might be arranged differently such that it might be make it easier for the operator to work or for the machines to work. 
And it's not just based upon machine work, it's also related to service. So the outcomes from a time and motion study are used in two ways, to help plan resources to match workload. So if serving a customer takes one minute and 120 transactions are conducted within an hour, two colleagues are required to cover the workload because you can't keep up with the demand. You need to do studies to see what is the workflow going through your particular business and to understand the time required for each step in the process, which enables businesses to focus on the improvement efforts. So you may think eliminating a once a month task or twice a month task that takes five minutes is good. It's better to shave seconds off a process, which is carried out all day, every day, because those minutes add up and time is money. So here we have an example for a coffee shop. Let's say that you could shave off time each, against each one of these steps. So let's go through the steps. Somebody has to walk into the coffee shop, as we all have done, take the order. You have, someone has to take the payment. Then someone has to go get the cup, maybe a tray, make the coffee, fry the milk. I'm a, what, Lauren, what type of coffee do you like when you go to the Starbucks? I like mochas. Lauren, did you hear me? Yes. I didn't hear you, Mike. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm asking you, when you go to Starbucks or Pete's or whatever coffee shop you go to, what type of coffee do you like? Oh, I like lots of oat milk lattes. <laughs> okay. So the more the more uh, difficult it is to make the coffee, the more time it takes because the more greens they need to use. And I've heard some very unique orders. For me, yes. I just like a basic mocha, right? Oh, you're <laughs> easy. I'm easy, right. <laughs> but someone still has to go through these processes, fraud the milk, make the drink hand of the customer. If there's a time and motion study taken, and there's a possibility of shaving off seconds on average, in this case, we, we assume 20 seconds should be shaved off in the first step and five seconds and 10 seconds, so on. We end up with 70 seconds, okay? If we assume an average pay per hour is $25, then you divide by the number of minutes. So it's 41 cents per minute, approximately, divide by 60 seconds. So every second is costing about 0 0.007 of a dollar to make that drink times 70 seconds. That's about 49 cents per order. Okay. And on average, a coffee shop serves 230 orders per day. Not in Santa Monica in the middle of the heat. It's probably more than that, okay? But on an average across the country. Um, so that savings is about $111, $112 per day times 360 days. Somebody has to take a big break. So we got a $40,000 savings. That's why it's important. The more time you can shave off on doing things, the more organized you are, the better for you are. I don't know about you, but I've walked into businesses that are completely unorganized and it takes forever to find something, right, Lauren? 100%, yeah. And uh, honestly, Mike, this chart shows you, is, you know that old saying, uh, time is money? <laughs> yeah. This is it. <laughs> right. So you might be saying, well, what's the difference of, say, five seconds? Well, add it up and then you'll know. Yeah. Okay. So what happened during World War II? Well, we had to mobilize an army to go fight a war, right? We were really ready for it. We had to put all sorts of systems in place to mobilize. And the U.S. Army did really, really, really well doing that. And I actually have a good friend who's at the top of the Pentagon. So the army is very, very efficient in the way it does things. And that is because the army has put in measures and ratings and a very systematic approach to things. If you've ever been in the army or the Marines or the Navy, you know how efficient they can be because time saved is lives saved. That's why. So some of the performance systems grew out of what happened during World War II. Now we move later on into the 19th, the 20th century. We have something called management by objectives. 
NBO. This has been taught in business schools since the 70s, 60s and 70s. There's a gentleman named Peter Drucker who has written numerous management books. Uh, his most famous one is called The Practice of Management, where he presented a holistic approach to operating an organization. And he introduced a discipline of business management. He was a true visionary. And he came up with something called Management by Objectives, NBO. He first outlined it in his book, The Practice of Management, which you can still buy. I gave a link here. And he's written other books since then. And he had a student that was working with him. And this became popular in the 60s and 70s. And it's still in place now. And now there's variations of MBO. And maybe you have worked for someone who's implemented MBO. So it's a management system in which the managers, employees work together to develop areas of responsibility. That makes absolute sense. I worked in situations when I was younger where it was all top down, you know, just do it. That doesn't work anymore, especially in an environment like this, okay? So MBO is where the, everybody, you know, the employees and the managers get together to develop what needs to be done. It's a control system, no question about that. So you have jointly developed business objectives that are made to align with company goals. So the first thing is you need company goals. If you haven't established your company goals, come see us. We can help you establish your goals, right? And then you get to your business objectives. And then the managers and employees develop plans for achieving those objectives. This makes absolute sense. It's logical, right? So the standard set forth, it uses metrics to determine, to determine performance. With MBO, so long as it's done properly, the worker is engaged in the development of the objectives. It's not just a top down, it's, these are the numbers and this is what we need to hit, okay? So this was developed based upon the belief that employees perform better when they understand what is expected of them. And that is true. It allows the employee to associate the individual efforts to the objectives of the organization. I realize we've all worked in many different places and we've all had good bosses and bad bosses. The good bosses work cooperatively with their workers. The bad ones stay away from. Don't be a bad boss, be a good boss, in my opinion. So here's the process, management by objectives process. Define your goals. If you don't have goals, there's no point in doing this. So the first thing you have to do is define your goals for the business. I wanna generate $500,000 in net income and $5 million in sales over, over the next five years. Okay, you've got a goal. I wanna add three more offices in California over the next three years. Awesome, we got a goal to shoot for, okay? Define your goals, right? I wanna establish uh, a beachhead in San Diego through blogging and through content delivery. Awesome. Now Lauren has a goal that she can shoot for. But if you don't have the goals, you can't blame the employees for not meeting them. <laughs> Lauren's going, yep, she's been there, okay? Define the employee objectives associated with the goals. Don't make the objectives unrelated to the goals. <laughs> What's the point of that? Okay. And you have to support the goals. You have to put money behind it and resources. Lauren, we want you to go open an office in San Diego, but we're not going to pay you to travel there. Would you like that, Lauren? She's, did you hear me, Lauren? I didn't. Sorry about that. Okay, so, so what I said is we want you to open office in San Diego, but we're not going to pay you to travel there. Would you like that? No. No. Are you going to give right? me that company car? <laughs> <laughs> no. I've been in that situation. I was told that I have to take my car to go visit someone in Los Angeles, and I was looking in San Diego, and it was a business-related trip, and I was going there to deal with inventory accounts. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why am yeah. I taking my car? You have a company vehicle. Sorry, uh-uh. Your happening. car, your gas, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, exactly. And they weren't going to reimburse me. I'm like, nope, not well, happening. No. I, got, I got the car. I got the company car. Oh, that's <laughs> smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So define employee objectives, continue monitoring performance and progression, right? Provide feedback. So it's one thing to set the goals and objectives, but if you don't tell them how they're doing, then what's the point? And that's not feedback at the end of the year. That's, it's feedback consistently. 
month. And like, I don't think it needs to be so formal either. Like if it's a, if they set it up where it's like a, a, a quarterly or a biannually, like more formal um, setting, then fine. But I think that a quick, hey, you're, you know, that report you wrote, I love that aspect of it. Or, you know, the way you're working that machine, that's awesome. Or, you know, just feedback like that is um, performance appraisals as well. Or that's you providing, sorry, feedback. Right. So. Exactly. So you're going to wait until the end of the year, give them a performance appraisal and tell them everything they did wrong. And by the way, they've consistently been doing wrong since day one. Rather than telling them up front they did something wrong, they could improve on it. And then they don't make that mistake consistently. Right? Or if they're doing well, you give them the pass on the back, you give them a reward. You, you, you recognize people for what they're contributing to your success. That's what people like and appreciate. And I'm sure you would like and appreciate it too. And if it's happened to you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I also noticed that like um, when I've ever have to, had to manage, um, even if it's a, a something negative or something that you would like them to change for starting out with what they're doing great. Well, you know, I love how you were doing A, B, C, and D. Here's how we can improve, um, you know, the latter, the, the the other half of your job or what have you. Like it doesn't have to be so uncomfortable or contentious. Um, just like you said, like the same way you would like someone to speak to you should be, of course, how you're speaking to your employees. What would you, how would you respond to things? You don't want people yelling at you or constantly telling you how terrible you are. Um, you might have another situation if that's the case though. <laughs> but um, just providing feedback um, and just providing insight, right? into how you feel like, how you feel that employee is doing and um, what you, you know, what you are um, uh, excited about or happy about as it relates to, you know, their job. Excellent, thank you. So five steps in MBO, find your objectives. Your objectives must be clear, realistic, measurable, and achievable. Well, we want to double our sales in the next 12 months. Really? Is that really achievable? Don't have unrealistic goals, right? Let's make them realistic. Let's make them transparent, not fuzzy. Well, we want to be, you know, uh, we want to increase sales. That's not telling one anything. That's a meaningless objective. Quantify it. Translate objectives to employees. Once the objectives are decided, explain them to employees. I want to, we want to return, we want gross margin percentage to be X by the end of the year. Vast majority of employees don't even know what that means. By the way, vast majority of our clients who are owners of companies don't know what that means because financial literacy is the largest gap when we see clients. So make sure that the employees understand what you're talking about when you define the objectives. And they need to be aware of it because if they don't know what they are, then you can't hold it against them or you can't reward them, okay? Make sure they know their role in the process so they can cooperate. Explain things to them. I really don't like companies who do not provide explanations as to why they're doing something. Why do you need me to work 20 days straight? What's causing that? Okay. If you don't tell me why, that's a problem. So you need to be transparent about many things with your workers. Not everything, but many things. By the way, some companies are actually publicly uh, to their own employees listing everybody's salary. They're not hiding it from everybody else. So everybody knows in that company what everybody else is earning. Do I think that's a good idea? No but some companies are doing it. Make progress measurable. That's the key. You have to measure the results and you have to provide the resources that employees need and monitor progress to see how well they perform. If you do this, by the way, oftentimes they'll meet or beat the project, you know, objectives. And so if the objectives are being met, management congratulates them, rewards them. There's going, to be, there's going to be professional growth. If you have a great worker and the only thing holding them back is, look, they need, a, they need a high school diploma or they need a college degree, pay for it. 
give them some sort of portion of allowance to pay for it, okay? Or pay back some of the student loans. Evaluation and feedback, evaluate the progress, as Lauren said, not just at the end of the year, frequently give feedback back to the employees and make sure you reward those who deserve it. Don't just say, hey, great job. Lauren, you did an awesome job. See you next year. <laughs> so what? I mean, great, I did an awesome job, but anything else? Now, what some human resources directors have tried to do is they have tried to de-link or decouple performance reviews from compensation, and that's a deliberate approach on management's part. Don't take that approach, because if you're telling someone they have done great on their job, they really should be rewarded for that. And by the way, if they haven't done well, give them a performance improvement plan. But do not, in my opinion, de-link compensation from performance. So what are the components of an MBO? Well, the strategic, these are the objectives, these are broad general objectives determined by the company. We want to increase market share by 5% throughout the entire company. They are always set forth. There are tactical or team objectives, the more specific objectives. I have examples later on. It may require the collaboration of teams and operation of individuals, specific objectives belonging to an individual. These can be very different from employee to employee. I think there's a question. I'll answer that in a minute. This quantification of objectives. So you have to really quantify the goal. We want to increase production. By what? I have these conversations quite a bit with clients. You know, I want to, I want to earn a lot of money. What does that mean? Right? Lauren gets these questions too. And we always have to ask for quantification. I need a loan. For what? How much? When? You need to be more specific than that, okay? So the final component in MBO is to perform the appraisal, the review, uh, and give feedback and reward good behaviors. I think there's a question in the chat room, am I right? Yes. Uh, from Someone wrote from my experience experience, people don't change no matter what. You're not asking to change character, but behaviors can be modified based upon various factors. So let's be very clear about what we're talking about. Um, there was a question, I believe, in the chat or on how can you pay for student loans or a portion of student loans? You just put a program in place. Set up an appointment with an advisor. We can help you figure that out. All right, here are some real examples of MBO goals. MBO goals. In the human resources department, keep the quarterly retention rate at 95%. That's quantifiable, okay? Get 10% of hires from employee references. Nice goal. Hold a minimum of three interviews for new hires. Yeah. Yeah, put a standard in place, okay? Sales. Hit the win rate of 20%. If you're not doing these types of things, if you're not setting objectives for yourself, you should be, right? Achieve new customer target of 50 per month. Get 25% more leads. Close deals up to eight times faster. Now, I don't know how someone's going to do that. Eight times faster is pretty significant, but if you can, that's awesome, okay? In finance, finish reviewing compensation agreements. This should be something else tied to that. Within three days, develop an annual operating budget by October 31st with less than a 5% variance to actual when measured at the end of the year, right? Help increase quarterly shareholder value by 2.5%. Performance management, promote a new department and supervisor within three months. There should be something else added to that. Gain 5% more market share by the end of fiscal year. These are examples, real life examples of MBA goals. I think I said MBA, MBO goals. So what's the good about MBO? Effective management employees leads to overall effective management. Yep. Because of clear organizational objectives, it's easier to drive a well-planned strategy towards the growth of the organization. Without a clear purpose, employees lose motivation. Key factor, right? So MBO transparency helps employees have a clear path laid down ahead of them. 
and two-way communication provides a clear and transparent environment. But there's always some bad, right? So MBOs emphasize the setting of goals to obtain objectives without a systematic plan. People want to achieve set targets by any means necessary, including shortcuts that aren't always good for the business. Yeah, I'm going to increase sales by X amount by giving out bribes. Okay, that's not cool. Okay. Being objective oriented, MBOs often ignore other elements such as the culture, the work life balance, and other mode involvement opportunities. That's true. And the MBO does not focus on the significance of the context wherein the goals are set. Right. All this can be modified appropriately. Um, now, we're into key performance indicators. This is important to understand. Every business, every business owner should have KPIs in place. The minimum of three, usually it's five to 10. This should be daily, weekly, quarterly, monthly, yearly KPIs. My question to you, if I was talking about KPIs, is what's the first thing you look at with regards to your business? First three things you look at when you wake up in the morning, or when you go to bed at night, okay? As advisors, we have to meet with clients. So I have to look up every, and I ask by my wife every night, how many appointments do you have tomorrow? When are they? Those are my KPIs and how many do you have for the next week? Because we, we have to plan our week around it, okay? Your KPIs as a consultant may be the same thing. Whatever they are, you should develop them. And there's hundreds and hundreds of KPIs you can choose from depending upon your industry, you look them up. But you should at minimum select three that you look at every day, okay? So KPIs provide targets for teams and individuals to shoot for, milestones to gauge progress and insights, okay? So there's a difference between KPIs and metrics. All KPIs and metrics but all metrics are not KPIs. KPIs give a holistic view of the performance of different functions. Metrics give you a picture of how different individual activities rolled out within the functions. A balance sheet is a metric. A balance sheet is an indication of your financial position at a stated period of time. That's a metric. It's not a KPI. That's the difference. A financial KPI would be how many orders did we ship yesterday? which would then lead to a result, which would eventually end up on the balance sheet, okay? So KPIs tell you where exactly your team stand in respect to their overall business goals. Individual metrics do not give you insights at their own. So if you're looking at a balance sheet, for those of you who are familiar with balance sheets, it's gonna tell you what your cash is, what your assets are, what your liabilities are, what your equity is. Unless you understand how to read a balance sheet, it's really not gonna give you much information because you don't know how to read a balance sheet. More importantly, you do not know how to interpret a balance sheet and take action based upon the information you have. And it's better if you're gonna have a balance sheet to have a comparative balance sheet, month over month, week over week, quarter over quarter to show trends, okay? So examples of KPIs, pre-sales KPIs, email marketing, customer success KPIs, metrics, open rate, conversations in the last two weeks, deals lost last quarter. Those are the kind of differences between KPIs and metrics. Oh, here's one of your favorite topics, Lauren, marketing KPIs. So we have total visits this quarter of 2.15 million. We have number of ops created this quarter, 1,917. And net new logos this quarter, 577. Awesome, this must be a marketing agency, right? So these would be some typical KPIs. You understand this chart, Lauren? Yeah, she gets it. Okay. Now we're talking about something called OKR. So we've moved from MBO to KPIs, and now there's something new called OKRs. I know there's a lot of acronyms here. It's called Objectives and Key Results. It's a collaborative goal-setting methodology used by teams and individuals to set challenging, ambition, 
ambitious goals with measurable results. There's a difference between OKRs and KPRs and metrics. OKRs are how you track progress, create alignment, encourage engagement on measurable goals, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're talking about the office, software engineering, nonprofits, OKRs work the same for setting goals about the company. They can also work for you personally, okay? So I'm gonna show you examples and give you more information about OKRs. Okay? So here's the anatomy of an OKR framework, objectives and key results. Objectives are goals that inspire and set direction, right? Key results are steps that measure progress towards an objective. And initiatives are the tasks required to drive progress to key results. So this is an OKR framework. Keep it in mind, you have the objectives, you have the key results, and you have the initiatives to reach those results, which will then meet the objectives. Okay, so here's some examples. I'll make this bigger again. Um, one minute. All right. So we have our teams here. We have the sales team, we have the marketing team, the human resource, the product team, the customer success team, the finance team. Typical functions within a business. Okay. Uh, what's missing from here is the operations folks. So what's the objective for the sales team? Achieve record quarterly revenue and profitability. Okay. And the marketing team, become a thought leader in the industry through our content. Human resources, make the company a desirable place to work. Product team, improve the product release process. That's a good one. Customer success team, create a great first impression to prospective customers. Should always do that. Finance team, Finish raising a new round. Yeah, absolutely, of capital, because you can't do any of this stuff without money, right? So, sales team, what is the key result? Double gross profit margins from 32% to 64%. That's a very hard thing to do. But if you can pull that off, well, that's awesome. If you get a 5% increase in gross margin or 10%, you're doing well. Doubling it from 32 to 64%, that's very aggressive. I don't know too many companies that could do that, but if you can, good for you. Increase SQL to final conversion rate from 45% to 60%. Decrease the sales cycle from 27 days to 15 days. That's also difficult to do, but if you can achieve it, that's great. And you can see on down the line here, other key results associated with the objective tied to a team. So with the product team, reduce the bugs reported after release to 30%. Yeah. That's a pretty high rule. That's a pretty high bug rate. You don't want to have it even that high, right? Increase the app store rating from 4.0 to 4.3. Decrease the server downtime from two to zero. Right, good luck with that one. All servers go down. But here you go. Here's the differences. Here's, here's an example of OKRs established for each team at a company with the objectives and the key results. So we have KPIs versus OKRs. I know, key performance indicators versus objectives and key results. So OKRs are comprised of objectives, key results, okay? Objectives are short qualitative descriptions. You just saw them, okay? KPIs are some specific quantifiable measures of success. The main difference in OKRs versus KPIs lie in their purpose, scope, duration, buildability, and flexibility. And I have more examples. So we'll, here we have OKRs versus KPIs. There's the differences down the side, purpose, scope, duration, go goal, flexibility, right? So with OKRs, the purpose is focus, alignment, engagement, and transparency. With KPIs, it's to evaluate activities. It's two different things, okay? With OKRs, the scope is broad. With KPIs, the scope is narrow. With OKRs, the duration is short. With KPIs, the duration is long. With OKRs, the buildability, that's a no. With KPIs, it's a no. With flexibility, it's a yes. And with KPIs, it's a yes. And more examples, right? So this is the OKR process. 
you will align. So great OKRs enable cascading of objectives and goals throughout the organization. Everybody needs to know what the OKRs are. You just saw an example for each team at a company, right? Great OKRs are a key driver of employee engagement. And they're there to inspire, connect employees. So if I go back to the example we saw with, let's say, that production team, how great would it be to reduce the bugs reported after at least 30%? Let's say they're 50%. That production team would feel great, I suspect, because it made a significant achievement. How great would the sales team feel if they actually doubled gross margin? God, there should be a huge party in that company if they did that. Okay. Um, sorry, I went back too far. So here's some examples of OKRs again. Create a world-class employee onboarding program. So we wanted it. Create a world-class onboarding employee onboarding board, right? So in order to do that, we have to imp improve employee satisfaction after onboarding to 95%. Okay. We have to ensure 90% of readiness employees in four weeks, and we have to map 100% of new recruits with mentors. It's a good goal, right? And at the top, there's a bar that shows where they are in relation to the overall goal, right? They're at 30% or 33% of the goal, one third of the way there. Here's another OKR example. Grow revenue in America region. Okay, we wanna grow the America in the America, revenue in the Americas. So we have to increase our demo outreach from zero. So I guess they weren't doing anything, to 100, good goal. Increase a ARR, annual uh, recurring revenue, from 2 million to 4 million. Awesome. Increase the number of channel partners from 10 to 50. That's hard to do too, but it's a good goal. They're 41% of the way there. So we're moving away from OKRs. We talked about KPIs, OKRs, and now we're talking about SMART goals, okay? So SMART goals are an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So specific goals are well-defined and clear on what needs to be accomplished. They're measurable, can't be fuzzy. We want to increase sales. That means nothing, okay? We want to double our gross margin. That means something, okay? So they have to be measurable, right? They have to be attainable. Well. Are you really going to increase you know, your gross margin from 32% to 64%? That seems highly unlikely. So they do need to be attainable, okay? They're relevant. Well, they're important to you and make a material impact on achieving your larger objectives, okay? We want the janitorial staff to clean faster. Is that really relevant to increasing your gross margin? Probably not. Okay, time-based goals. It has to be there has to be a time, a specific time frame associated with the goal. So you don't want to just establish goals; you want to establish smart goals. So specific increased sales from everyone, measurable, with twenty percent compared to last year. There we have the measure, right? Achievable. Focus on the strongest areas. Demos. Remember that other uh, previous slide, they weren't doing any demos. Well, if you do some demos and you do some webinars, you might hit this 20% increase, okay? It has to be realistic and it has to be time bond. Time bond. We want you to do this by the end of this year's Q4, okay? So here's some more difference between, between OKRs versus SMART goals. So OKRs are aspirational, SMART goals are realistic, OKRs have a goal setting framework, SMART goals have goal setting guidelines. OKRs represent the why. SMART goals represent the how. OKRs are best for long term goals. SMART goals are best for short term goals. OKRs are flexible and agile. SMART goals are fixed and rigid. OKRs are effective for multi metric goals. SMART goals are effective for single metric targets. Okay, we're almost done. I know we're getting close to the time. So we have our core. An example are an OKR versus a SMART, SMART goal. So the goal is to increase blog time. With an OKR, we're going to use our blog to become thought leaders in, in, in its industry. We're going to increase organic traffic to our blog by 35% Q3. 
We're going to double our blog subscribers. That's the second key result. Third key result, we're going to decrease the bounce rate. We've talked about bounce rates in previous sessions to 30%, and that's actually a pretty high bounce rate. Uh, and key result four is to increase the average session duration by 20%. Whereas a smart goal associated with increasing blog traffic would be specific. The marketing team will publish three well-researched blog posts a week. Okay, they'll use Google Analytics. And if you don't know how to Google, use Google Analytics, send a message to Lauren. She'll hook you up with someone who can help you figure out how to use Google Analytics. This is associated with metrics tied to websites. Okay, make it achievable. Content marketers, SEO specialists, graphic designers will work closely, okay, to achieve this goal. Make it realistic. So there's a personal resources in place and make it timely. We're going to release three articles a week throughout Q3. So this, these are differences, same goal, same moral goal, increase blog traffic, but approach them differently between OKRs and SMART goals. And that concludes my presentation. Um, so we're, we're popping up since the hour. Lauren, you want to add anything to what I shared? No, I think it was a really great presentation, Mike. Super insightful. Okay, somebody asked, do you have a link where they can find, hook up with Google Analytics that's in the Q&A? Can you put that in the chat room? Yeah, I'll put that, I'll answer their chat. Um, Marisol, I'd, I'd say that just like Mike mentioned, go ahead and reach out to a local SBDC center so that someone can assist you with that. Google Analytics can be a little daunting if you aren't used to, you know, the information that you're looking at. So you might as well pair, out, pair up with a um, expert. Remember, about, our services are free. <laughs> yeah, somebody's asking about ERC. So whoever's asking about ERC, make an appointment with one of us and that is familiar with ERC. And we probably refer you. We don't we don't actually calculate the ERC for you. It's a very complicated calculation. I think there's a tax accountant that was participated in this presentation. She was a attendee. Uh, that tax account may be able to help you out. Okay. There are people that are out there doing the calculations for ERC. Don't try to do it yourself. All right. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll see you next week. I think I'm done with the employee portion or, you know, this section of the workshop. So I think we'll move on to something else. If someone asked about insurance. I think we'll spend more time on insurance next week. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good week. Bye, Mike. Thank you. Bye, Lauren. Right, so I just put it in the, um, I just answered your question. So hopefully you can grab that link to Google Analytics. Um, let me see if there's anything left. Oh, let me drop it into the chat as well. All right, everyone, that is it. Uh, Chio, I'll be looking for your email. And thank you for joining us again. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.